to cut your energy use, cut your carbon use, and, uh, you know, cut your footprint. There's a, a recipe for this that you can use in your house, and really, it's a mini version of the recipe that I think is the most effective way society can cut our carbon, and that's what they call a three-legged stool. And we're talking tonight about the first leg of the stool, which is efficiency. And what that really means is energy does work. So only use as much energy as needed to do a task. Easiest example is light bulbs. You know, I could light my room with an incandescent or an LED, except an LED is way more efficient, like 95%. So that's the concept here. I agree with you, and I just wanted to back you up. I just read something. They were talking about how within two years, two to three years, they, there's a good chance the world will be running on 50% renewable energy. Mm -hmm. It's happening that fast. That's one of the other legs. The second leg, which is in between that, is convert fossil fuels to electricity. And when you go from an engine to a motor, you save about a third. Two thirds to three quarters of what you pay at the pump is going out your tailgate. It's not doing anything to move you down the road. If you don't believe that, just touch the manifold of your uh, your car or the tires or the tailpipe or whatever. You know, right. you've been driving for a while because most of the potential energy in gasoline, which by the way is only a small fraction of the potential energy that was in the oil, that was actually taken out of the ground, most of that is converted to waste heat. And the waste heat is destroying us, essentially. If we ran the whole world on electricity, renewable electricity from wind power, solar power, uh, hydropower, what else, whatever, we would need 56% less energy to run to the, the world. Do the same amount of work. Do the same amount of work. So we're losing half of all the energy we, we're getting, all the fuel we're burning, goes up the chimney and smoke, or out the tailgate and smoke. Or, or now let's look at that. Let's take it a step further here, because when we look at where in the United States, where our energy is consumed, uh, almost 50% of it are related to is related to buildings, what we're talking about today. Because right. Although there's some differences, fundamentally, a building is a building, whether it's used for commercial, industrial, or um, residential right. purposes. And, so, and it all has to be heated to 70 to 65 to 70 degrees. And, and so what we're talking about tonight, particularly the air ceiling, is the lowest of the low hanging fruit that we can get. It's cost effective. You know, people, I got asked the question again this week, Bob, in one of my talks, the question, you know the one I mean, what is the payback period? What's the return on investment? And when you do stuff like this, this energy efficiency, it's off the charts. The um, paybacks are like, the returns are like, you know, half a year six weeks and you've paid for the air you're now not leaking out of the um let me say something in agreement with you one of the things it was an interesting article i read uh, it was from geoharvey.com mm -hmm. and and they were talking it was an article in clean technica i think and they were talking about uh, renewable energy and they said that uh to put the whole world on renewable energy it would cost us 72 trillion dollars to mm -hmm. do it immediately, mm -hmm. which is fairly expensive. The other side of that is the return on investment is six years, six years to pay back that $72 trillion. trillion dollars. That's an interesting statistic. Yeah, so can we start a company and do that? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I want in on that investment. Yeah, yeah. When I first, when we first started thinking about this, you know, I, I had the realization pretty quick that I'm in a business that can actually do something about it. I build houses. 
the houses that I build, uh, if they're typical of what's around us, are going to be around here for 200 years. And if this house is pumping out extra energy, it won't work. We need to design the houses so they can run electric heat, uh, which is not hard, but it's different. Uh, and it's, it's paying attention to physics. It's paying attention to how houses really work in, in all of our houses. They all work essentially the same. Uh, it's all based on the, the uh, on moisture flows from high pressure to low pressure, how heat flows from warm to cold. All of those things, a lot of things feel like they flow the other way. You sit next to a, a single pane window, you get cold, and you think you're getting, you're feeling cold from the window. You're actually losing heat to the window. So That's exactly right. The heat's Radiant. kind of going the opposite way you think it is. Right, but because never- you've become, since you're warmer than the window, you're the radiant body giving off the heat, and the colder it is, the larger the surface of that window, the, the, the bigger the ratio and the more heat you give off. Right. You know, it doesn't it. matter whether it's 70, what the air temperature is. You know, right. this is the same reason that a fire warms you even when it's 20 degrees outside, but you're standing in front of a, a hot fire or one of those radiant heat gizmos you plug in and it doesn't heat the air in the room. It's a radiant source of heat presumably warmer than you, and so the heat flows from it to you. As soon as it's right. shut off, it's flowing from you to wherever. Cause it's yeah, clear. yeah. So the, the easiest thing in a house and the most productive is to seal the air leaks in your house. That's a huge change. It really is. I mean, I've done it in my house. I don't know what the blower door test is. I haven't tested it since then. But I know the house is a lot more comfortable. And I know that, uh, like I said about the basement, I'm 55 degrees down here for the whole winter. We just did a house, Sherry's house. This was a a camp, a summer camp. And they did a blower door before they started. It was 28 air changes an hour. And they got it down to six, which is a great. And and I did confirm with my friend. It's not great? Is that what you said? I mean, it's. It's, it's way okay. better than it was making it livable in the but a second thing is that um I did confirm with Terry Brennan the my friend who's a building scientist uh, that the air changes per hour measure gets a little wonky with smaller houses and this house was only like 600 square feet or something it's yeah, very, yeah a very very small house part, part so, of that is the there's a lot more the relationship between the interior square footage surface area. and the surface area of the walls and roof mm-hmm. are, you know, you can have a 3,000 square foot house that has a surface area that's, uh, that's not five times the surface area of the 600 square foot house because this right. still has a bottom, sides, roof, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's still got all that space. So anyway, the key is to get that number down, to get it as close to zero as you can. Mm-hmm. Uh, you won't get it to zero, so don't worry about that. Right. But, uh, well, so ju- you want to get it tight. What do you expect? Just out of curiosity, where do you expect to be with this complete renovation you're doing? We've done one major uh, insulation retrofit in the past. In that house, uh, we did nothing to the inside of the house, but we changed the whole outside. We changed all the windows, all the mm-hmm. exterior doors. Uh, took off all the siding, all the roofing, and added insulation to all the surfaces and new windows and doors. That was the one by the lake, right? Yes, yes. Um, And that one, and except for those two houses at 1.5, every other house we've done, uh, about 20 or so, are uh, at one air change an hour or less. Wait a second, are you talking a, a new house or a retrofit? Well, that's what I'm saying. That was a retrofit, and that house came in the same as all the, as the new houses. He said it was about 0.2, so it's actually the best 
the best job we've done, which is not really surprising because we're careful to close up every single vent hole on the inside of the house. We had a chimney, a multi-flue chimney. We closed off every opening in that chimney. We closed off every vent that was going to the outside. And in redoing the walls and the roof of the house and the windows, we dealt with every exterior surface in that house. So we doubled and triple taped it and there were no air leaks in that house. So that's actually the best project we've done. So in this house, I expect it would be under one. Wow. Let's clarify something that that's a deep energy retrofit. You're doing you're stripping everything down to the bones there. Right, right, right. So if you do that, there's no reason why you can't get it really tight. Mm. The the energy code in New Hampshire calls for seven air changes an hour, which means you have a leaky house. The national code calls for three air changes an hour. Passive house, the passive house standard, something like 0.6 air changes an hour. So it's it's very tight. And at that point, they say it's very easy to heat these houses. Uh, so most of the houses I built are pretty tight. They need to be in order to keep the heat in. They're also very well insulated, which means that they don't take much heat to start with. Uh, Wes, you might have a different take on this, but whether or not We've got an R40 in the wall or an R13 in the wall. The most important thing is to keep the heat in the house by air, air sealing. sealing. Yeah, right. No, I right. completely agree with you. It means having more insulation means you'll use less heat. In my book, we follow a couple of your houses that have double walls. The biggest insulation question in most houses um, is how do you stop the thermal bridging? You know, they typically have in a two by four or two by six construction house because as much as a third of the surface area can be those thermal bridges, the, the framing of the house. I'm convinced that, that if you could put continuous insulation someplace, that gives you that gives you a lot of benefits, but the benefit is more than just the it's cumulative there because it's more than just the added R value. It's the stopping of that conductive heat loss. Right. Otherwise, right. Yeah, I've I've done I've I've built houses basically uh, two basic methods. One is double double stud wall where they're ten sometimes twelve inches, so you have two two by four walls with a space between them of three to four inches or three to five inches. And you've just filled the whole space with insulation. So you have no thermal bridging in that space between the walls. You do have thermal bridging at the floors. The other method of building I've used, and that's what I'm going to uh, deal with some more in the future going forward, is exterior insulation where you put exterior insulation on top of the sheathing, not instead of the sheathing, but on top of the sheathing. And, and it goes down to the bottom of the floor framing and right up to the, to the uh, rafters on the roof. So you're covering all the floors. So there's, it, it means you have virtually zero thermal bridging in the house. And this you could do in, a, in many retrofits, too. It's, it's the easiest way to retrofit a house if you want to add insulation, if you're not getting the inside, especially if you want to reside the house. You can do two inches. I'm not talking about the quarter-inch stuff they use when you're doing vinyl siding. That's, that's pretty much useless, except if it's, got air, uh, if it's got aluminum foil on it, then it's actually dangerous. How is it's it dangerous? Well, it's dangerous because if it's aluminum foil and you're putting a, a hair barrier, foil on the outside of your house and you have a, a plastic uh, air barrier on the inside of the house uh, and you get moisture in the walls for whatever reason and it, it won't be able to dry out because Got it. yeah yeah that's a good point you can't have two moisture barriers in a house right it's a great great way to mold grow mold and that's why we had all these mold claims in the 80s and 90s that were on the news so much. It was from exterior uh, air barriers and moisture barriers, exterior moisture barriers. So never use a uh, moisture barrier on the outside of the house unless you have no moisture barriers on the inside of the house. So we have used uh, foil, exterior foil on the outside. Uh, some houses we've used uh, other types of foam that don't have a, a, a barrier on it, uh, that are just the f plain foam. So there are, there are choices out there. 
Now, but I want to get back to something you said before. You're getting your houses in a deep energy retrofit down to, you know, half an air change an hour or, or lower. For the average person who's not going to, you know, take off their siding, they just want to improve their efficiency. I think that's a pretty stiff goal to be looking for. And let me just ask you what you think about this. Because I've heard, you know, a lot of houses are eight plus air changes an hour. And I've heard if you get them down, if you get it down below three, you need you need mechanical ventilation. It's one of those things that the better, the, the tighter it is, the more comfortable it's going to be. Mm. So even if you start out with 12 and you get it down to uh, eight, it's still drafty, but it's going to be more comfortable. Exactly. The more, yeah. you, the more holes you can close up, the better off you are. Uh, and a lot of the holes uh, are going to be large areas that you've just kind of ignored. Uh, and I don't say that uh, in, a, in a mean way because I've done it myself. I've been in business now 51 years. And at 35 years, when I took the Passive House course, I started out hoping to build better houses than what was out there because I knew what was out there wasn't as good as what could be done. And there were all kinds of ideas through the 70s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. There were, uh, let's put rocks under the floor and blow heat through them. Let's use big pieces of glass. And let's use thermal drapes. Let's do this. Let's use a better wood stove. And in each case, they all work to some extent. And ultimately, uh, some of these ideas are still being used. Some people still have wood stoves, and, and that's fine. And some people still use thermal drapes. And what we learned through all of this is that we never connected the dots that you do this because of this, you do that because of that. It was all, somebody would come up with an idea, and we'd all try to use it. And they were all good ideas. What Passive House did was it looked at it from the science, from the physics of how houses work. So it's no longer, I just think that putting a piece of insulated fabric is going to be nice. It, it was, what's the science behind this? What's the science behind losing heat out of this window? What's the science of how a house works in total? How, where air comes in, where it goes out, uh, and why? And this was what the Passive House course taught. It was really how a house works uh, through physics, how, how the heats and, and pressures and air and hot and cold are moving throughout the house and how in order to build a bed house, you've got to stop that. And, and I just want to throw in a quick plug now for ventilation because that's when you make a house tight, you have to ventilate it. And when I tightened my house, I put mini splits in. I did a lot of changes. I did not do anything about ventilation. Um, and I realized after a couple of years, the house was, was pretty, uh, you know, the air wasn't that good. It was, it was kind of stale. And, and, uh, and I thought, now is the time. And I found a uh, HRV. I, I put in an HRV and I ducted it throughout my basement and I ran it up through some floor registers and through some holes I had to the second floor. I put a supply and return in the basement. The air down here is no longer musty or anything else. It's, it's, it's just like it is in the rest of the house. It's very nice. It's one of the biggest pleasures I have now is just breathing fresh air all the time you know um, if i could put a plug in for my book we talk in detail about a lot of these subjects right we've talked about tonight including ventilation systems and you know they work the thing about it that impresses me so isn't just the savings three of the people in my book reported uh improvements of health everybody right. who lives in these houses reports they're the most comfortable houses they've ever lived in. Four of the five houses that I reviewed were net zero. All of the energy you use comes from solar panels in your in your yard. Uh, it doesn't mean that you never hook up to the grid because the grid is used as a battery. Uh, the grid takes your power when you don't need it, and they send it back when you do need it. And if you're if you're only paying for delivery all year then that's how you get a really low electric bill. And none In my of case, pay. we're paying about half of what we used to pay for everything. We still are paying a bill, even with solar panels. So we're not that's there. We. But 
none of these folks in the book, two of them houses you built, spent more than $500 a year for heating, cooling, and electrifying. And right And that's now, all your lights. That's everything. Lights. Electric you know. stove, everything else. This has been good. Was there anything else you wanted to add tonight? I think I'm pretty much talked out. Uh, yeah. Okay. As I well. say, if I don't see you in the future. I'll see you in the pasture. Hi, this is Wes Gollum, the Energy Geek. I hope you found this video helpful and interesting. If you did, I would appreciate it if you would like it and subscribe to the Energy Geek channel. Please leave your comments below and thanks for watching. Want to learn more? Check out my new book and video series, Warm and Cool Homes.